Good evening and welcome to the Cancer Education Series brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. And it is my privilege to introduce to you our founder, Dr. Richard Deming, who will introduce our speaker. Dr. Deming? Great. Thank you, Chris. And it is my honor to introduce our speaker tonight. So our speaker hails from a farm near Lacona, Iowa, and uh, um, she actually went to uh, the Southeast Warren High School in Liberty Center, got her undergraduate degree at the University of Nebraska, and then got her Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine degree at National University of the Health Sciences in Illinois. Uh, Valerie Ripperger practices integrative medicine. You'll learn what integrative medicine is during her talk. And her talk is entitled The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. So Valerie, thanks for being here this evening and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Deming, for letting me come today and to talk to all of you. Thank you, Chris, for taking the time to figure out all of the technical shenanigans so that we can make this happen for all of you guys. So. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, like Dr. Deming said, that I uh, grew up in a small town called Lacona. I got my undergrad in social work and psychology from the University of Northern Iowa. And as I was going through that, I knew that I wanted something more. And I actually have had my own experience with cancer. I didn't have to go through chemo or radiation, but I did go through a surgery that forever changed my life and they don't have the options that they do now as they did 25 years ago. And as I went through this, I um, was actually fortunate enough to spend some time with my grandmother. I was supposed to leave to go on a uh, tour to do some little mini Broadway type of productions, but my grandmother became very ill. She'd lost a lot of weight. <clears throat> um, she started drinking, didn't leave a very healthy lifestyle, and she was smoking a lot. We finally were able to take her to the doctor, and they unfortunately diagnosed her with lung cancer. And shortly thereafter, it was terminal lung cancer. And I was blessed enough, I was uh, um, able to stay home with her and take care of her. One of my last conversations with her will forever change my life. And she basically said, if you can do me a favor and promise me that you can help one person that has cancer not go through what I went through, then that I'll be able to die in peace. And still 25 years later, this gets me emotional because it's very humbling. I've spent 25, close to 30 years of my life searching for alternatives for cancer care. And I ended up going to massage school, been a massage therapist for 25 years, started actively working with the American Cancer Society and being an ambassador for them, working with uh, doing trainings for Relay for Life. Knew that I couldn't help people in the capacity that I wanted to. People tried to get me to go to osteopathic school. I just didn't feel that that was for me. I found naturopathic medicine, fell in love, and here I am today, and Dr. Deming is gracious enough to allow me to share some information with all of you that hopefully you can take some bits of this information and apply it to your healing journey. So I will go ahead and pull up my presentation. So today we're going to talk about what is integrative medicine and basically what is a naturopathic doctor, naturopathic medicine, and also the metabolic approach to cancer. Now this is a lot of information I know and I'm not going to be able to dive into all of it, but I want to give you enough knowledge for you to decide, okay, I think I would like to dive a little bit more into this. So first we'll talk about what is a naturopathic doctor. We are actually educated and we're trained at a accredited naturopathic school. We take basic science boards that are similar to a medical doctor and also take clinical boards. And I basically tell people that I am your private investigator for your health. I work on restoring 
optimal health for you by supporting your self-healing with more natural type of modalities. I will say that, um, and also we focus on the root cause. So naturopathic doctors, I will say since we're in an unlicensed state, there are a lot of people that call themselves naturopaths and may even be as bold to say a naturopathic doctor. So I wanna encourage all of you to make sure when you're talking to a healthcare provider, don't be afraid to ask them, hey, tell me about where you went to school because there are people that say they are natural paths and they have just taken a one year online certificate or health coaches. So I wanna empower you to make sure that you just ask questions. So a naturopathic approach, we basically, we have several different foundations of health. First, do no harm, identify and treat the cause, healing the power of nature, doctor is teacher and treat you as a whole person, we focus a lot on prevention as the best type of medicine. So a lot of the history of naturopathic medicine actually comes from 400 BC. Hippocrates taught a lot of the fundamentals of naturopathic medicine. And in the 18th and 19th century, conventional medicine was used, they used leeches and mercury during treatments. I know that probably sounds very strange, but that actually was their form of treatment back then. And naturopathy was a movement away from a lot of harsh treatments back then that they truly believe that nature can stimulate healing. Several hospitals actually exclusively use a lot of homeopathic medicine and I know that they still do to this day. They have a lot of naturopathic pr principles that are highly regarded within the medical profession until the 1940s when penicillin became widespread and then that's when the pharmaceutical companies began to um, subsidize medical schools and began to basically use the more conventional type of treatment. They do have a lot of evidence-based research that shows a lot of the natural remedies can be just as effective as some drug therapies, often with a lot less side effects. So what is integrative medicine? Integrative medicine pairs with traditional medicine with other treatments and they help to care for you with mind, body, and spirit. So for example, you have integrative medicine is more of a terminology that a lot of medical doctors will use that have a medical doctrine degree. Then they go back for additional schooling more of similar to what I do, which is naturopathic medicine. So they use the terms more integrative medicine. And this is where the patient and the practitioner, they more part partner within your healing journey. So they have all factors that'll help to influence your health, wellness, and diseases that are taken into consideration. But the nice thing about it is they can use both conventional and alternative methods to help facilitate your healing plan. Now we're gonna talk about, you're gonna hear me use a lot of the verbiage on assessing your terrain. Now terrain is a term that I'm gonna use about your personal internal and external systems, right? So I often will explain to people, I have to, your terrain, I have to lift up the hood to see what's going on underneath the car. So I need to know what's going on inside of you to help heal a solid foundation. And basically this is all including everything with your heart pumping, your lungs breathing in the air, and you're able to respond to outside events, including exposures to certain stressors and pollutants. Now, whether you aim to prevent cancer or you've been recently diagnosed with it or you're in remission, it's essential to assess all the elements that could or contribute to its development. And you identify and prioritize the potential drivers of the cancer process so that you can gain the ability to put the brakes on that runaway truck that's basically fueling that deadly disease. The mechanisms governing cancer development are multifaceted and interconnected, much more than just a name, age, and diagnosis. Each section that we're gonna talk about is gonna have an assessment to determine what areas that you have to focus on. So the metabolic approach to cancer. So this basically helps to prioritize 
and it focuses more on a naturopathic nutrition program that uses more medicinal powers of the traditional foods, diets, non-toxic lifestyle approaches for um, cancer. So we're gonna talk about a few of the main terrains that we're gonna focus on. And some of them are gonna be genetics, epigenetics, nutrigenomic modifications, blood sugar balance, toxic burden, basically repopulating your microbiome, which is your gut, and focusing on how to maximize your immune system and recalibrating stress levels and the biorhythms. So the genetics and epigenetics and nutrigenetics. So what does that really mean? So the science of epigenetics basically tells us how messages from your personal DNA code come and they become blocked, lost to some sort of a metabolic change in your body. And this is likely to build up of some homocysteine in the bloodstream. So homocysteine is a type of amino acid and a chemical that your body uses to break down proteins. Now in our genes, um, we can change in response to our environment and that always has just like when good kids go bad, when they're exposed to a negative influence, our genes can exert harmful or expressions depending on what factors that they're exposed to. So a poor diet can damage your mitochondria turning on cancer promoting oncogenes. So the mitochondria that I talk about is the powerhouse of the cell and it's responsible for con converting fats, carbohydrates, glucose and usable forms of energy. But the main function is to produce something called ATP, which helps to produce energy in your living cells. Yet a genetically attuned diet, which is similar to the ones that we have eaten over 2 million years ago, can keep these oncogenes silenced and the mitochondria healthy. The genetic mutations considered by conventional medicine as the root cause of cancer are, in fact, they're modified by epigenetic factors. So they are well established that the genetics of the cause are only five to 10% of cancers. Most of these genes encode proteins that impact the mitochondrial respiration. And it's the mitochondrial damage that causes the cancer, not the genes. If the inherited cancer gene does not damage the mitochondria, then the cancer will not occur. So this may be some news to your DNA, if it's not your destiny, rather than to have learned that genes function more like light switches, they just become personal tests positive for the BRCA mutation. For example, it doesn't mean that you will get breast cancer. Our genes can be flipped on or on depending on our exposure to certain environmental factors. And those things will include diet, lifestyle, stress, Researchers in a lot of the field studying of epigenetics have been studying these environmental, they're called fingers, which are responsible for switching the genes on and off, learning a lot on how these genomes actually work. So you can think of your genome as a complete set of a DNA, like billions of Christmas lights running through your body. The epigenetic factors, such as poor diet, our exposure to carcinogens, toxins, are the fingers that turn on a strand of those lights from being expressed or illuminated to silenced or to turned off. Too much or too little exercise, trauma of any kind, chemical stressors such as infections, food allergies, processed foods, environmental toxins, <clears throat> such as like fluoride and other metals, emotional, financial stresses, issues with children, spouses, or loved ones, all of these impact genetic expression. Every thought, every bite, every lifestyle choice affects genetic regulation. If we expose ourselves to positive epigenetic factors like some deep nutrition, exercise, good sleep, stress management, and healthy relationships, our genes will express smiles and help and not frowns and disease. It sounds simple, right? But in any ways, it is. But let's just try to explain the DNA genes are simple as possible so that the very complex concept is genetic becomes a touch easier to comprehend. 
A poor diet can damage mitochondria, turning on cancer-promoting oncogenes. Yet a genetically attuned diet, which is similar to the ones, like I said, that we have lived millions of years ago, can keep these oncogenes silent and the mitochondrial very healthy. Now, for the nutrigenetics, this is another emerging field that studies the interaction between diet and genes. So far, the findings have been significant. So for example, dark leafy greens can affect gene expression through epigenetic modification processes, such as methylation. And that basically regulates a gene expression by recruiting proteins that are involved in the genes. And there's a growing body of evidence that certain dietary compounds, including folate, vitamin B12, tea, um, teas, vegetables, and more, they all have anti-carcinogenic properties because of their relationship to the DNA. There's now an undeniable associating, association between diet and genetic health. So with the metabolic approach to cancer, ketones are a fuel that is more difficult for cancer cells to consume, glucose. It deprives cancer cells of energy targeting for the fundamental cause of cancer. So high fat doesn't mean fast food and eating lots of heavy meats and fried foods. It basically means to replace with healthy fats such as avocados, avocado oil, olive oil, chia seeds, flax seeds, nut butters. Now each individual is different. So be aware that there are food sensitivities and allergies that you wanna make sure to be aware of. And these can contribute to systemic inflammation. But all meats, you wanna make sure that they are all organic. Eliminate all processed foods. Anything, basically I tell people, anything in a box. This may be permitted, however, it's important to limit the amount of toxins that you're putting into your body so that you're trying to heal from a very chronic condition. Now you might be able to modify it, but it's important to maintain a healthy style, lifestyle, improved quality of your life. The other thing that I really am a huge fan of is intermittent fasting. If you're consuming water and green tea, That'll enhance the ability of nerve cells to repair their DNA, protects the DNA from damage, and it switches on the DNA repair genes. Now, when you start to do this, I always tell people, make sure that you listen to your body. Most people should be able to do this fasting for at least six hours. So you want to work up to this with doctor supervision, from 12 to 13 hours, and then 16 hours once a week. A little bit later, I'll go into more detail on exactly how the intermittent fasting works and the physical benefits that it'll have on your body. So a lot with the healing modalities. Um, so food is truly your medicine. You want to make sure that it's going to provide you with energy, nutrients, proper hydration, good Nutrition supplies your body with all of the vital nutrients that you are gonna need. Whole foods is key, but you wanna make sure that it is truly organic. If it's not organic, I know that it can get expensive. You want to make sure to clean it. So I always tell people to clean it with a vinegar or a water type of wash. So again, if you're eating a whole food diet, this will help to support a healthy immune system, maintain your gut health, decrease inflammation, and provide the essential nutrients that your body truly is needing. The one thing to mention is when we discuss how foods supply the body with nutrients is the idea that their decreased level of nutrients in our food due to depleted soils. Now, granted that there's been some controversy over this, but there's been some good reports out there to sub support this claim. So we always wanna mention that there's a toxic burden on our bodies, which is very high. There are many things that we can control, such as the quality of the out 
that we can't, that are out of our control. We can't control the quality of the air that we breathe. And we have to make sure that we're making clean choices and that we can decrease the overall toxic load on our bodies. So choosing to eat clean and healthy food is one place that you can start and you can already make that choice. So one place that I know places, especially around in the Des Moines area, Costco is really good with um, a lot of organic and clean foods. And I know Aldi's, Trader Joe's, and then Whole Foods. So those are good resources that you guys um, can definitely have. Um, so the toxicity in food, like we talked about, a lot of times they are coated with pesticides on there. So I know right now is a difficult time and we don't have the farmer's markets, but if you can grow your own, you will avoid a lot of this type of situation where you have pesticides exposure. But if you're eating 12 of the most contaminating fruits and vegetables, and we're gonna go through those here in a minute, you can be exposed, a person can be exposed to nearly 20 pesticides per day, just on average. But if you're eating the 12 least contaminated, you can be exposed to maybe a fraction of over maybe two a day. So this is what a lot of us are probably familiar with is the dirty dozen. So the fruits top of the list are consistently most contaminated with um, the fruits and the vegetables. So all of these that are listed here, you wanna make sure that if you're not buying them organic, and even if you are, that you are doing some sort of a wash. I know Trader Joe's has some sort of a fruit and veggie wash. Otherwise, an inexpensive way to do it is just um, vinegar and water. Now, these are the least contaminated foods. And obviously, most people probably know this, anything that you are actually eating the skin, then those are the ones you wanna make sure that you're getting organic. Now, with the sweet corn I would and onions, I would want to make sure that those are organic. And asparagus, I would probably make sure that was more organic too. And a lot of them, just all of these, make sure that you are doing a thorough walk on these. Now, one of the other, the first one we're going to talk about is the importance and the connection of sugar and cancer. So sugar, actually, you wouldn't think this, but it is the most addicted, they call it a drug, in actually this country. And it's bigger than amphetamines, alcohol, heroin, and nicotine, but it's legal. So... I know it sounds strange, but it's in everything that you drink, everything that you eat. Cancer cells ingest sugar, all kinds, at a rate that's almost 50 times faster than healthy cells. It's the main fuel that helps them grow and helps them spread. There's researchers from Harvard Medical School that's reported up to 80% of the human cancers are driven by the effects of glucose and insulin, which stimulate the growth of progressive cancer. It can stimulate cancer cell growth, inhibit cell death, promotes metastasis, and also helps the cancer cells resist radiation and chemotherapy. And if you ingest any type of sugar, glucose, fructose, sugar, honey, even the fresh squeezed orange juice, that reduces the activity of immune cells by up to half for five hours after you consume. And it, can an, and it can analyze your entire immune system. There are 60 different types of sugar. It's found in almost everything. All processed foods, whole grains, ketchup, pasta, yogurt, these are truly just to name a few. And when sugar is processed in grains, soda, preservatives, trans fats, synthetic oil, pesticides, all of this, if you replace it with organic, wild, and fermented vegetables, bone marrow, and organ meats, healthy fats, certain herbs, and adequate hydration, that terrain is going to shift in a matter of days. The epigenetic that we talked about, markers will change, blood sugar levels will decline, 
immune systems are fortified and hormones will begin to balance and your digestion will improve, toxins are gonna be removed and fogs of depression are gonna be lifted. Sugar falls into basically two categories. You have natural and you have added sugar. Natural sugars are in foods like fruits, milk, and honey. Added sugars are in processed foods that are just extra sugar that they add to food. And when it comes to cancer cells and sugar, there's a saying, you can put a lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. So whether it's organic cane syrup, agave, barley malt, dried fruit, soda fruit juice, high fructose corn syrup, white sugar, honey, date syrup, and even a banana, it will still cause your blood sugar levels to rise and cancer cells will eat it. So now let's look at milk and milk sugars. So one cup of low fat cow's milk contains about 13 grams of sugar in the form of lactose. A natural form that's 65 to 95% of America can't digest. And when they can't digest it, high levels of sugar are circulating in your bloodstream causing your digestive and your immune issues. And this can lead to anxiety, depression, migraines, weight gain, and a lot of other symptoms. So while some people can consume dairy without difficulty, others should avoid it. And depending on the tolerance and certain lab findings, dairy in its rawest form is always best. So the golden rules when it comes to whole food nutrition, it is best to always eat it to close to its natural form as possible. And when the fat is removed from dairy products, their sugar content increases. So we'll talk a little bit about agave. Agave actually is sap that's derived from an agave plant. And that plant to product is typically, typically undergoes a chemical process that usually uses a genetically modified enzyme that clarifies and filtration chemicals and that agave hector is actually higher in fructose than high fructose corn syrup. So I'll let that sit for a little bit. I know we like to use some sugar substitutes and there are far better ones than even agave. But as you're going through this, it's always best to completely eliminate it. And I'm not saying that this is something that you would have to do for the rest of your life, maybe indulge once in a while, but there are times when you have to be very restrictive and create a solid foundation so that your body will have an opportunity to heal. Now, so increase of glucose in insulin, basically it can, ex it can promote excessive cancer cell growth, cancer cells, remain immortal and cell cycle progression. And there's a number of ways to elevate glucose and insulin and it can cause a metabolic imbalance, increase cancer risk and increase metabol metabolism of glucose and it can affect several hallmarks of cancer. And that includes excessive proliferation of the cancer cells and the ones that I had just mentioned so this is the development also of new blood vessels, and that's angiogenesis. And this can continue to feed the cancer cells. And in 2013, there's a journal of clinical investigation reports that has high levels of glucose that triggers the expression of several growth factors. And one predominantly is P53 protein. This is a tumor suppressing gene. It prevents genome mutation, and this basically means that the diets high in sugar take that P53 off the job, and it leaves cells more prone to unchecked DNA damage and the formation of cancer. Now, insulin stimulates the, the release of pro-inflammatory chemicals, and those are called cytokines from human fat cells. So diets, when you have a banana for breakfast, sandwich for lunch, and pasta for dinner, this is going to promote an inflammatory environment that is considered to ignite the fire to cancer. And elevated insulin levels can inhibit natural killer cells that can create a waterfall effect, developing a resistance to your chemotherapy treatments. So glucose markers to consider to have possibly your doctor monitor with you is um, hemoglobin A1C, 
And this is basically a form of hemoglobin used to identify the average blood glucose over three months. You have fasting glucose. This will detect the amount of glucose that circulates in your blood when no food has been consumed for at least eight hours. And then you have the um, IGF-1, which detects the levels of this growth hormone. And its activity is similar to that of insulin in the blood. And then you have the fasting glucose or fasting insulin. This detects the amount of insulin circulating in the blood when there's no glucose that's been consumed for at least eight hours. This can be helpful to detect your um, insulin resistance. This is a powerful step of limiting your sugar intake to natural sugars like berries, for example. This is just a great place to start. The next one we're going to talk about are carcinogens linking to cancer and detoxification. So carcinogens basically is any substance that contributes to the process of cancer formation, including causing mutations, promoting tumor growth, and exposure to carcinogenic toxins that cause some sort of a mitochondrial damage inflammation and oxidation. This disrupts hormone balances and suppresses your immune system. This is found in so many things. It's found in new cars, carpet, laundry detergent, skincare. I know that this, this, this can be a little overwhelming, so that's why I just tell people to make sure to focus on healthy choices of the things that you come into contact on a daily basis. So, how does carcinogen cause cancer? So innate me metabolic activation, which means that the chemical conversion of a benign substance into a more hazardous one. And initiate, it'll initiate metabolic activation, induce DNA damage mutation. It can alter your DNA, suppress immune function, and induce epigenetic changes. This is just to name a few. So the route of entry can go through absorption through your skin. You can inhale it through your lungs, ingest it, goes through your digestive tract, and you can have some sort of an injection of ambient exposures. So when a carcinogen substance enters your body by any of these routes, acute or chronic effects can develop. Before cancer develops, symptoms of toxicity can surface from an immediate reaction, such as a rash, difficulty breathing, fatigue, skin eruptions, constipation, autoimmune condition, fibromyalgia, depression, brain, brain fog, the list can go on. And there has been an issue uh, that was published on June 2016. It was peer reviewed on the Journal of Environmental Health Perspectives. And it was a completed a review of all group one. And these are considered human carcinogens and identified isms of carcinogenesis. So with carcinogens, I always tell people, begin eliminating what you come into contact on a daily basis. Skin care, body care, makeup, cleaning supplies. I do have a PDF. I have, I don't know if anyone can see this. It was a beautiful little document that a dear friend of mine that is an esthetician from uh, Waterford Place. It's a cancer resource center in Aurora, Illinois. Beautiful facility. She put together, I think it's 12 pages, and it goes through safe, simple, and effective skincare for cancer patients. So this is a wonderful PDF. I'm happy to share it. So whatever the best form to get that to you guys, whether you email Chris or you email me directly, I'm happy to share this with you. But this is a, a wonderful document that gives you safe uh, chemicals to use. I shouldn't say chemicals, but skincare, body care to use on your body. There are a few things. I know women like to have nails. I have something. It's spa ritual. You would probably have to order it online, but it doesn't have any formaldehyde or a lot of the chemicals that are um, very harmful. So you want to be careful with a lot of, um, especially with personal care products and cosmetics. They have formaldehyde, 
coal tar is basically found in hair dye, shampoo, conditioners, and scalp treatments. You also want to be cautious of mineral oils. A lot of these can induce DNA damage, mutation, suppress immune function, and alter your DNA repair. So there is also, um, I have a, a great resource. It's, did I put it on this one? Let's see if it's on this. Oop. I did on this one. So I have this website. It's www.ewg.org slash skin deep. That's a great resource for a plummet of information. It gives you guides for healthy skin care, healthy cleaning. It educates you on environmental toxins. So this is a great resource. The other thing that I wanted to address too is electromagnetic fields. They're also known as EMFs. These are products that are in our mobile phones, computers, wireless networks, and other devices. You want to be cautious of those. If you would like more information, there's a book on uh, EMFs, and let me see, and then I have it on the next slide below. I wanna share with you a personal experience that I had. Um, I had gotten a smart watch last summer, never had one before, and within four hours, I felt like a elephant was sitting on my chest, couldn't breathe. I had just probably driven, you know, 3,500 miles. So I went to my doctor and they wanted me to go to the hospital. He's like, I don't even want to touch you. Go to the hospital, go through a whole ramification of tests. They said, well, either you're having a pulmonary embolism or you're having a heart attack. Everything came back normal. They were discharged me and said that I had acid reflux was not the case. I found out later, it was on my left side. I had chest pains on my left side. I was wearing my watch on my left side. So I removed my watch and within 20 minutes, I basically, my symptoms started to get better. I was able to breathe more, but it took me five days before I returned to normal. And so my point on saying this is I now have a sensitivity to all of these electromagnetic fields. So if I'm in front of a computer, I have to have some sort of a device in front of that to help repel that. So that's what is going to be on the next slide. And that's where this shop link is that you can go and it will provide you with a certain EMF devices that you can either wear, whether it's clothing or it's a necklace or something to place onto your cell phone. The other thing that you want to keep in mind to work with your doctor is to consider having some tests done to determine some toxicity. So there are, you can receive a detoxification panel and you can make a donation to 23andMe. You can go through Genova Diagnostics that offers a detox genomic profile that'll help to show uh, related SNPs. So SNPs is basically a single nucleotide that can affect how your body is processing or metabolizing things. And polymorphisms can help to predict a person's response on certain drugs, susceptibility to environmental factors, and developing certain diseases. So these are all really important to, um, if you think that that's something that you could be exposed to, to determine which um, perhaps uh, metal, heavy metal that you've been exposed to, there are healthy options that you can detox. So your major detox organs are your kidneys, liver, gastrointestinal tract, skin, adrenals, gallbladder, lungs. Now, when I take a patient through a detox, there's two safe ways that I basically do this. And it's something called UNDA drops. UNDA homeopathic drops are very, very safe. They do not contraindicate with anything. And that's great for a heavy metal detox. This is something that it's a bigger bottle, but this is for your adrenals. And it helps to drain all of those so then we can continue to build on a solid foundation. I also have for another heavy metal detox, more of a chelation. I have a suppository that bypasses your liver and it's super safe, very gentle. Again, doesn't counterindicate with any of your chemo, radiation, or any other um, 
any other prescriptions that you may be on, but it's always important to make sure that you have a deep nutrition foundation and do not do this unless you are being facilitated by a healthcare provider, whether it's a naturopathic doctor or your primary care physician, oncologist, make sure you're working with someone because another thing that's very crucial is you wanna make sure that you have a supplement called charcoal. Charcoal is a binding agent that's going to, um, bind to all of those toxins and heavy metals or whatever you're trying to remove from your body and basically pull it and allow your body to filter it out. If you do not have that binding agent, then it'll just continue to flow systemically throughout your body and your body will just reabsorb it. So again, we're going to talk a little bit more into depth about the intermittent fasting. So as I had mentioned before, everyone should be able to fast for at least six hours and fasting without food by drinking water is one of the most innate ways that a body can actually heal itself. Detoxing is achieved by, it's called the migrating motor complex. And that's also known as the house cleaning wave. So it's a reoccurring motility pattern in the stomach and in your small bowel that during when you fast, it's interrupted by food. When you fast approximately every 90 to 120 minutes, it's going to sweep the residual debris and bacteria through your gastrointestinal tract. This is going to reduce overgrowth, bacteria in your gut, reduce DNA damage, increase absorption of the nutrients, and that's including amino acids and especially your B12 vitamins. So fasting is basically a form of short-term starvation that causes the cells to switch into this protective mode called differential stress resistance. And during these changes, your levels of glucose, your IGF, changes, it protects your healthy cells. Your cancer cells don't make this switch. Sorry about that. So your cancer cells, they don't make this switch. <laughs> Sorry about that. So that's my little interruption. So we're talking about how when we intermittent fast, the cancer cells, they can't make this switch, which basically makes them more vulnerable during chemo and other cancer agents. So um, with the sauna, the sauna is a form of a detox, and that's a perspective that's actually, there's a lot of published evidence that using high temperature saunas or baths reduces levels of chemicals. And in the beginning, you're gonna to wanna to take your temperature and pulse about every five minutes. You don't wanna stay in the sauna for more than 15 to 20 minutes in the beginning, and you wanna follow with a 30 second cold rinse. The heat shouldn't be more than 140 degrees, your pulse shouldn't be more than 140 beats per minute. If you become dizzy, you wanna make sure that you come out of the sauna. So if you don't have a sauna, you can drink something called yarrow or ginger tea. And it's in a hot shower. Or you can take an Epsom salt bath, which might be a little bit more of a gentle approach to begin with. But the toxic burden can cause so many imbalances that your terrain areas, including hormone imbalances, oxidative stress and immune suppression inflammation, these are just to name a few. And it's imperative to make sure that you continue eating a clean and low glycemic diet that is actively working to detox um, the environmental carcinogens and the toxins. So the microbiome, which is basically a microorganism that protects us from germs, breaks down food to release energy and produce vitamins. The role of these supportive microbiomes is basically also beneficial. It's a beneficial bacteria and the bacteria involved is regulating tumor proliferation, including cancer cell. It's called apoptosis, which is killing the cancer cells and it modulates inflammation. It trains our entire immune system to influence metabols metabolism in our food and our pharmaceuticals. So one of the biggest things to focus on is leaky gut. If you've got cancer 
any chronic acute condition, autoimmune disease, constipation, diarrhea, chances are you probably have a leaky gut. And what does that mean? So you will have systemic inflammation caused by undigested food particles that are floating systemically through your bloodstream. If you have this, you may have a gluten sensitivity. So let me explain about gluten. So gluten releases this chemical called zonulin. And I tell individuals, this is the gatekeeper to these tight junctions in your intestinal wall. And when that is activated, that zonulin will release and open up these tight junctions that are, and will allow all this food particle to flow free through your bloodstream. And gluten can also go through um, something called cell mimicry. And what that does is that engulfs other cells and your immune system thinks it's gluten, so it will attack it because it thinks it's a foreign invader. And that actually has happened to me. I have Graves' disease. And when I have um, cut my diet into half and eliminated all of my gluten, my T3 levels, which affects my heart rate and my thyroid, was cut in half. So gluten is very, um, it's, if you have a leaky gut, it's definitely something that you want to refrain from. There's a lot of amazing foods out there that are um, available with a lot of options. Many other things impact the health of our gut positively or negatively, and they can be avoidable or they can also be fixable. So remember that the body has an incredible ability to heal, especially our gut. Amazing things can happen even in 48 hours. So. There are herbs with natural antibiotics that are options, and there is certainly a time and a place for antibiotics, but an overuse can cause a crisis of superbugs. It can cause DNA damage and autoimmune conditions. But there's a few things that have been super impactful, and garlic has actually been found to inhibit tumor cell growth and induce tumor stress. Garlic should be consumed daily. I would recommend probably to take a capsule of some sort because I could not eat three cloves of garlic a day. That would be very, very difficult. But oregano is another one that's great for um, intestinal infections, especially for candida, which is considered to be a yeast overgrowth. I put on here the Super Bio Veg. That is probably the must have that I have as far as a staple for whenever anyone is sick, but to have on hand for any kind of bacterial infection. Now there are some tests that you can have to work on healing your gut to identify what's going on. So you've got all of these that are listed here. Um, so the U-Biome is a comprehensive stool analysis and also does a parasite assessment. You've got SIBO and V-Biome. Those are tests that assess bacterial overgrowth, parasites, food sensitivity profiles. You wanna make sure to check for H. pylori and definitely um, Candida yeast overgrowth. This will help guide you and your practitioner on the best way to approach how to heal your gut. So with the microbiome, you wanna target three main things. You wanna target certain foods, prebiotics, probiotics, fiber, soluble, insoluble. So with the dietary fibers, you have non-starch fruits and vegetables, and those can be broken down by digestive enzymes. So fiber passes through the stomach and the small intestine like a scrub brush, and it goes through our large intestine then in our large intestine, fiber continues as a microflora. Soluble fiber then dissolves in water. So good uh, soluble fibers are Brussels sprouts, flax seeds, and asparagus. Insoluble fiber helps to control the consistency of the food so that your GI tract and um, the phase it passes through. So cabbage and celery, those are good sources of fiber that'll help promote healthy bacteria. Now you've got probiotics, Probiotics, um, the World Health Organization actually derived from live organisms that offer health benefits for the host. Probiotics are living microbes and prebiotics are their food. So the prebiotics discourage growth of 
um, certain things and help to prevent constipation and diarrhea. It'll help keep your blood sugars level and stable and helpful with lowering ammonia. And that's very beneficial for people that have a liver disease. If you're supplementing with a pre and probiotic during chemotherapy or a course of antibiotics, I usually recommend it's 100 billion colony forming units a day. Now you may have cramping or have bad diarrhea for at least the first three to four days, but the symptoms usually will subside after three or four days. If not, lower the dosage and gradually reintroduce it. Again, all of these changes, I encourage make sure that you work with you know, your oncologist, primary care, or a naturopathic doctor to help facilitate all of this. And then you can reintroduce it. But research has found that pre and probiotics are best taken at bed because the microbes are more active at night. So it's best to take this at night. Now, if you're truly trying to heal your gut, I always tell people, Pre and probiotics are great to take, but if you have a leaky gut, then you gotta have a little bit more to support that. So I have a specific protocol that I have put together that does include these two things, but about three other things in addition to that. So that's something that you're interested in. Make sure to let me know. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the immune system. Now, the immune system basically has millions of cells that are hard to work circulating through your bloodstream and functioning like your own homeland security team. They're looking to destroy foreign, external, and internal invaders like bacteria, viruses, and they also damage and rapidly dividing cancer cells. Our immune system needs to know what is supposed to be in the body and what it isn't. Cancer cells are similar to a person dressed in black, hiding in the shadows. They're able to create disguises and shield from the immune system. And when the cancer grows, its ability to evade the immune system increases anymore. And the cancer cells are, they're clever little guys, and they're able to get into certain immune cells to switch teams so that they join them and then they help promote their growth. Specific types of macrophages are embedded into the tumors and the intention of activating a destructive immune response, but end up helping the tumor grow. These are tumor-associated macrophages, and these secrete these growth factors that stimulate the angiogenesis and secrete the metastasis and suppress your immune system, and it neutralizes any cancer-killing activity. And when working correctly with macrophages, they should truly eat cancer. But with the level of functioning of our macrophages are compromised when the vitamins B6 and B12 consumption is very low or if the individual has some sort of food allergies. So with the immune system, we talked about the leaky gut, food allergens, leaky gut, and gluten. So food delivers present the biggest challenge for immune system. Every bite and every sip that goes into our mouth and through our digestive tract, as we discussed about the tight junctions earlier, they open, rupture, a vast number of antigens in food enter our bloodstream, and then that's basically what we call a leaky gut. So that gluten is that protein that's found in major grains, including wheat, barley, rye, that zonulin that we spoke about earlier, that's been linked to oral squamous cell carcinoma, and it's been observed in glenoma patients. There's a lot of gluten-free options that are available in grocery stores and restaurants, and it's, it's a lifestyle that you definitely have to adapt to, but it's significant. You can notice a huge difference if you eliminate that out of your diet. As I had mentioned earlier, not only was I able to help um, regulate my heart with that, but I was able to get off of my blood pressure medication just by eliminating the gluten. Now that was just my story. Um, so there are nutrient deficiencies. So a deficiency is just one nutrient that can result in altered immune responses. It can affect that can occur, occur even when the deficiency is mild. So the five main micronutrients are vitamin A, C, D, and the mineral selenium and zinc. These nutrients along with complete proteins support the immune system by a number of mechanisms. 
And among them are the immune cell system supporting the anti-cancer Th1 immune response, promoting, producing antibodies and cytokines. The antibodies are the proteins that signal the immune system to basically get to work. And cytokines are small proteins that regulate inflammation and your immunity. Now, vitamin A has two types, the retinols and the carotenoids. Without enough vitamin A, those leaky tight junctions we spoke about earlier, those won't repair. Those will also help to boost the immune system and inflammation. Now with vitamin C, 75% of the cancer patients are, they are deficient in vitamin C. So foods that are rich in vitamin C are broccoli, red bell peppers, rose hips, and Brussels sprouts. Vitamin C has antiviral, antibacterial properties, and selectively increases the poisoning of cancer cells. It reduces the carcinogen effects of toxins on DNA and the inflammatory to just to name a few. And the other one is vitamin D3. That deficiency in this vitamin has been correlated to colon, breast, prostate, and ovarian cancer. Selenium is a trace mineral. Its uh, deficiency in this mineral results in immune suppression, including impairment of natural killer cells. This also is gonna help protect the body from heavy metals like mercury and lead. And those that have the mutation of the BRCA1 gene have a greater frequency of double-strand DNA breaks per cell. This frequency of the breakage is greatly reduced when sel selenium supplements is consumed. This is a great, a great natural source of that is Brazilian nuts to consume about three or four of those every other day. Zinc, zinc is involved in practically every immune function. It's important for the neutrophil production, which is a type of white blood cells and natural killer cells. Zinc improves your thymus. Your thymus function can restore immune. Zinc competes with copper for absorption. So high levels of copper are a driver for many cancers. A good source of zinc are pumpkin seeds and pecans. You can soak them overnight so then you'll help to um, allow it so that it can absorb more easily into your body. And we were talking about the thymus. I'll talk a little bit later about a tapping technique that you can do as we talk about stress. So stress is the most powerful carcinogen. There's several different forms. There's emotional, physical, chemical. Any of these stress can trigger a complex metabolic cascade. So it's promoted in the body, mind, stress. So it's angiogenesis. Stress comes in many forms, as I had mentioned. A chronically stressed out lifestyle is out of sync. And what happens is that starts to affect, it's called your circadian rhythm. And that's basically how you sleep. And things that can affect that is excess screen time, little outdoor time, eating non-nutrient food, and this will cause disturbances in, it's the pineal gland, and there's a hormone called melatonin that's produced there and also cortisol. Cortisol is not produced in the pineal gland, but those two can affect your impact of being able to sleep. So this chronic stress increases insulin resistance, inflammation, and it'll increase the IGF, which is weakens your immune system and alters your gut flora. This is about stress Think about stress as it affects your body's function and what we just mentioned above. These are all changes that basically affect the carcinogenic process. So we'll talk about oxidative stress. This damages the mitochondria and this causes systemic inflammation. So you see the pattern of all of this systemic inflammation. And this basically has an imbalance of a free radical. And this is something that damage, they're damaging particles in your body and antioxidants in your body. This can lead to cell and tissue damage. So take a look at what you're eating. Non-organic food particles are coated with toxins. So again, wash with a vinegar and water bath before you consume it. So sleep is truly the elixir of life.
and you want to make sure that you are getting adequate amounts of sleep. Most people struggle with falling or staying asleep, but to improve the quality of sleep, it'll, you want to elevate your head, black out curtains to remove all of the light and reduce room temperature to about 68 degrees. You want to remove the Wi-Fi, blue lights. These can all disrupt your body's ability to sleep. Adults need about eight hours of sleep and kids need about 12. When we sleep, hormones are released, tissue growth and repair occurs, neurological pathways are restored, detoxification occurs, and the immune system is replenished. So you want to make sure that you're making good choices. Prolonged exposures to lead can lead to serious health conditions. Lifestyle changes can minimize these effects that your body is going through. I'm looking for my one slide. Ah, here we are, melatonin. Melatonin and cancer. So melatonin is a hormone made in the pineal gland, which is located in the brain. And this is not usually, the pineal gland isn't usually active during the day. When the darkness basically switches on and begins to produce the melatonin, melatonin levels are usually really high at night for 12 hours. And the cortisol levels are supposed to be low. Notice I said supposed to. Sometimes cortisol levels are elevated, overpowering our melatonin, and it affects us to get a good night's sleep. Artificial lights outside of your normal daytime will affect the melatonin production. And melatonin triggers tumor suppressor genes. It suppresses tumor angiogenesis, and it works in a powerful and carcinogenic antioxidant that can cross actually the blood brain barrier. So taking melatonin supplement is one approach that most powerful epigenetic and terrain uh, changes is balancing your diet and lifestyle first. So as I talked about with the healing modalities on stress management, some stress labs that you may want to take a look at are adrenal stress index panel. And this, is, this will assess your cortisol and circadian balance. This is a saliva test that will look at your cortisol levels throughout the day. So you're going to have to carry around a little thing and spit into it, unfortunately, for 24 hours. But it's probably the most accurate test that you can take. And it'll also give you um, help with stress markers. It's going to look for something called COMP, and that's catecholamines methyltransferase. And this is an enzyme that breaks down hormones like estrogen and cortisol. This has been linked to several mental disorders and certain cancers. Fortunately, magnesium and vitamin C can help those that particularly have this SNP. So again, with lifestyle types of stress management, naturopathic doctors can help to support with counseling, nutritional balancing, stress management, hypnotherapy, biofeedback, and other methods. So stress management, a lot of things to help with that is, of course, you need to make sure it's imperative to get as much sleep as what you possibly can. Your body needs to heal. And that's the best thing you can do for it. Exercise. Exercise where you're at. If you can't move, it doesn't matter what you do if it's gentle movement, whether it's yoga or going for a walk outside. Meditation, there's beautiful meditations that are online that are available. I love Hay House, that's a great resource to use. Breathing, breathing helps to calm your sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight, right? You breathe in through the nose, out the mouth, that actually helps to slow down your sympathetic nervous system. So you wanna inhale for seven to 10 seconds and exhale for seven to 10 seconds. Um, there's adaptogen supplements. These are something, again, you wanna make sure that you're working with your oncologist and if you have a naturopathic doctor that you're working with as well, because you do not wanna take your um, adaptogen when you are taking uh, your chemo radiation treatment because it impacts that in a non-beneficial way. Acupuncture is great tapping. So this is something that I do a lot with my clients and patients. I, you take basically this indentation between your fifth and fourth finger, place it over your heart, 
Just take some deep cleansing breaths in through the nose and out the mouth. Think of what's stressing you and that will help to offer some calming. I have a YouTube channel that I actually have gone more into depth on some coping uh, mechanisms and tapping techniques for dealing with stress and anxiety. Massage obviously is a great one, but there are so many more that you can include. Um, you just need to find, um, some people have more emotional that they need to deal with. So some more layers they need to deal with. So find an energy healer. If you're in the Des Moines area, feel free to reach out. I have some amazing contacts I can help you with that. Um, I do have a few little friends. So find whatever nourishes your soul to help calm stress or anxiety. I do a lot of like sound baths. So this is one of my singing crystal bowls. And that just vibration sounds helps to break up anything that um, not serving you. So I know we're probably getting close, so I'm gonna wrap this up real quick. <laughs> um, I basically do telehealth, and what that means is that my arms stretch far and wide. No matter what state that you reside in, I can offer my services to you. I have an online intake form that um, you complete. Now with my cancer patients, it is different. I, it is not a one and done thing. I'm working with you for at least a minimum of three months. We meet once a week and we go through all of this because I know that this is a lot of information and obviously I went over my time, but I think that that's a good place to stop. <laughs> Yeah, this has been amazing information. And, and as you said, you, you could take one topic and, and talk about it for 45 minutes just on its own. So yes. you did a great job of informing us. And we had a large number of participants this evening. So it was obviously a topic that was near and dear to many people as far as, inter as, as, far as gauging their interest, for sure. Um, there were a couple questions. One was uh, obviously how to get in touch with you. So that was, that was uh, a good thing to cover right at the end. The other thing uh, you mentioned about saunas, and that was one of the questions that someone asked, do you know if in the Des Moines area, if there are clubs or fitness centers that offer saunas, or is that something that, uh, that it does, uh, that is available out there? Right. Great question. There are. Um, so I know Lifetime has a sauna. And I think that there might be a little place, I can't remember, that's in Jordan Creek that you can purchase a membership. So most fitness facilities should have an infrared sauna. But as I mentioned, there's other ways that you can be creative to stimulate that same type of situation. But I think the fitness clubs are probably going to be your best bet to find those here in Des Moines. Okay. Sounds great. And they, as you put up there, you can see where you can contact Dr. Ruppiger and, and uh, for any further questions or if, uh, if you want to jump wholeheartedly into a diagnosis or conversation, I think you'd certainly be willing to do that, wouldn't you? Absolutely. I do. I schedule a free meet and greet. We can either do a video like this. I do it on, it's called doxy.me. It's HIPAA protected. So I don't, I feel very comfortable. I've never had any problems with that. And that way it gives you, you know, the individual an opportunity to express, you know, these are my main concerns that I'm needing help with. And then I am able to talk to you about more about what I do and kind of lead you through the process. Wonderful. Well, thank you for being part of our cancer education series this evening. And if it's okay with you, we'll bring you back to, to maybe uh, think about just a, a few of those things and, and dig a little deeper, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I would okay. love to do that. Thank you. All right. Dr. Deming, anything else? Yeah, no, thank you, Valerie. I really appreciate it. Lots of good information. And thanks for sharing your contact. We had uh, lots of people listening in and this will be uh, stored on our website for those who might have friends who missed it uh, or would want to watch it again and get some specific Yep, we will have it on our, our YouTube again, channel. Thanks again, everybody, and have a good evening. All right. Thanks again, thanks, Dr. Ripperger. All right. Take care. Thanks, Chris.